There's been a lot of potential changes suggested to large predators in the fossil record over the last few years. First off in the water, with Dunkleosteus becoming shorter, and not the 30 foot long behemoth that was once thought of, and then with Tyrannosaurus rex being potentially split up into multiple species, or even Nanotyrannus being valid. But now there's another one, and it's back in the water, and it's actually going the opposite direction of Dunkleosteus, potentially being even longer, and that's with Otodus megalodon, oftentimes just called megalodon, the giant shark that ate whales. This study was done by looking at some of its closest relatives, notably the lamnid sharks. So this includes things like not just the great white, but also mako sharks, poor beagle sharks, and salmon sharks. Also, I just love poor beagle sharks. They're really interesting and just kind of goofy. One of the biggest problems with identifying how large a shark was in the fossil record is most of the times they don't fossilize very well. And there's a few outlier cases like some of the shark fossils coming from Lebanon, but most of those are maybe a few inches long. They're not very big sharks. They're the much more common kind of sharks even today, generally small. This is because sharks don't really have bones. Arguably their teeth are their only bones with the rest of the skeleton being cartilaginous or made of cartilage, which doesn't mineralize as well. That means it's really rare to actually get a good sequence, especially for an animal as large as Megalodon. In general, with large animals, they don't fossilize quite as completely because you need to bury the whole thing. That means a whole lot of sediment needs to be moved into the location in order to actually get it covered up. That said, there is one pretty continuous vertebrae sequence coming from Belgium, and there's not any teeth associated with it, so it could be something other than Megalodon. However, it's very large, and in the kinds of environments we find Megalodon teeth in the most, and there wasn't really anything of that size that's known from Belgium at that time. So, for all practical purposes, yeah, it's Megalodon. This fossil is actually described in 2022, and you can kind of see the series of the bones they have there and how there are still gaps, but sometimes you can still make at least some inferences from what the shape and sizes of these vertebrae were. And so what this paper did is it looked at those modern relatives, notably great white sharks and salmon sharks, and looked at their vertebral series to try and see how long this animal could have been. But they also did one other step, which is they looked at the top jaw and how deep it was, essentially how deep, how far back does the top jaw and the mouth go, and then how does that ratio apply to the entire length of the shark. What they found is that that's pretty consistent throughout most species. At a ratio of 8.3, it's pretty different from what the 2002 paper actually suggested, which would have been around 10.6 for that ratio. Now, what this potentially means is just Megalodon in real life was longer than that 2022 paper suggested. That would actually kind of fix the ratio and bring it back down towards that 8.3 number, which again, aligns pretty well with the other lamnid sharks. The thing is, Megalodon isn't a lamnid, but it is a lamniform, meaning it's in the same general larger family, but not the super specific family. The phylogeny in this paper actually shows this pretty well with Megalodon being in the family Otodontidae and then the lamnids being towards the bottom of that entire family tree. The issue is all of these branches coming off essentially the same branch means it's a polytomy. So any combination of any of these groups being closer to one another than any of the others is possible. It's essentially just saying, we don't know anything about how these groups evolved relative to one another. And there's a ton of diversity in these sharks. Some of these are thresher sharks. Some of them are goblin sharks. But then you also have two separately evolving groups of large bodied filter feeding sharks, things like whale sharks, basking sharks, and also the megamouth shark. So you're getting huge amounts of diversity in this group, which makes it really, really hard to try and say accurately what was happening in an evolutionary sense and just how consistent those trends might be. This is especially true when you look at some of the older members of this group, like Cretoxyrhina, which had over 250 vertebra, but was seemingly pretty similar in size and shape to the modern day great white shark. And this is really interesting because that's one of the big comparisons in this paper when they looked at the vertebra. They actually have a perfect graph here where it shows these kinds of differences between Megalodon and the Great White, where the Great White has this really consistent placement for the size of its vertebra and where they go in the body, and in Megalodon it changes somewhat. It's not that nice simple curve and try and ignore the gray ones, those are just the ones that were heavily damaged so it doesn't give a great example of how large they were in life. But you can see it's still a different general pattern that's happening. Because of these differences between Megalodon and the Great White Shark, they suggested that it's probably pretty likely that Megalodon was actually longer than most of our estimates, potentially pushing itself over 20 meters longer, over 65 feet in length, an absolutely massive animal. But it also wouldn't be quite as stocky as something like a Great White, instead being more elongated. But again, Cretoxyrhina, 
more vertebra, but similar proportions to a great white from what we can tell, which makes it really hard to say, hey, these vertebral differences mean this entirely different body shape. We need to do a little bit more study on it, in my opinion. And there likely will be. There's already some researchers that have commented about the Cretoxy rhino thing and how that might throw a wrench into it. And they're also doing research on Megalodon that's suggesting shorter lengths according to what they've said on Twitter. So there's a good chance there's going to be some sort of rebuttal paper, and it's just a matter of how consistent these methods are. And I think one of the things this paper could have done better is actually looked at some of those other families of sharks in the lamniforms. Look at things like goblin sharks, not necessarily thresher sharks because they have weird super long tails, but there's other sharks you can look at and try and get a sense of how their vertebrae length and their mouth length actually lines up to the entire body length. And that would make a lot of sense if we're able to actually look at that and better understand the overall trends that are happening in this group. That said, it does make at least some biologic sense. We actually have a very recent find of a megalodon tooth 360 miles off the coast of Hawaii. It is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, literally in the middle of nowhere. And that means a megalodon swam through those waters at least once. This means some of these sharks were probably crossing the entire Pacific Ocean, and that would be easier to do with a longer tail that provides more thrust with just a single stroke of it, and that way the animals could move across the ocean easier. There's also the chance of finding one that's slightly more complete. The most famous of these actually comes from Peru, and the problem with that one is it's almost certainly a composite because those vertebrae at the back don't go with that size of a head of a shark. And this one was preserved in really, really wonderful conditions in the Pisco Formation, and it's incredible. It's great to see that. However, again, people need to actually study and publish on it before we say anything confidently about it. Because again, it's kind of a mishmash of different specimens. Hopefully we can figure out a little bit more once it's actually researched. But there's still potentially one other way to estimate the length of Megalodon, but that would involve some very specific fossils and some very intensive work. And that's because I mentioned teeth are really the only bones that sharks have, the only things that fossilize regularly. But they also have teeth all over their skin called denticles that help streamline the body by controlling the flow of water. What this means is if you do have a fossil where there's a big collection of teeth, essentially the Megalodon died, dropped, and all of the cartilage rotted away or was otherwise not preserved, but the teeth stayed there, those denticles still get preserved and they fall into the sand and mud. So what you could do is find one of these large collections of teeth, dig up a ton of sediment from around it, and then look at that sediment, find denticles in it, and estimate length that way. The problem is this would also be very, very intensive. Realistically, you'd need to be a PhD student to do this kind of study, because you would need to A, find this kind of fossil, which is already very rare, then do a ton of hard work shoveling up massive amounts of sediment, then analyze that sediment in microscopes to look for the denticles, and then log how many there were and the density of the denticles in the sediment at different locations, and then finally you'd have to also test that with recently live animals. So you'd have to take a recently deceased shark, place it in a controlled tank, and see where the denticles fall out into those sediments. And that would be a lot of work. Again, you'd have to be like a PhD student to really be able to complete that entire experiment. But hypothetically, it is possible. So what this means is there are multiple avenues for understanding how long Megalodon could have been, and that it may have been actually even longer than we've ever thought. 